Uh, welcome to uh, our NSHGPM webinar series. I'm Hawken Hamer, the Executive Officer. And um, before we begin, I'll just uh, say a few things. Uh, that the questions uh, during the course of the talk, please uh, submit questions for the speakers. That's at the box at the bottom of your screen. And um, you can actually chat, I believe, also with uh, people in the audience, at least I can. Uh, and um, we uh, will take questions at the end of the two talks, uh, uh, if there are any. Otherwise, we'll proceed directly to the panel discussion and questions can be, can be submitted uh, during that time as well. Um, I am, uh, just wanted to uh, mention one thing uh, before we start. Uh, we have been uh, trying very hard to confirm whether we can have an in-person meeting in Helsinki uh, this fall. And uh, as far as we know, we're a couple of weeks away uh, from being able to let everyone know the dates. Uh, after May 20th, we should know whether we can have an in-person meeting and get rooms in Helsinki. Uh, in, in, in any case, we have selected two weeks or two possibilities in, the early, in early November, and we'll let everyone know what those are, um, hopefully in by two weeks from now. Um, we will have a general society meeting uh, one way or the other, and we will have a satellite meeting on uh, responses to COVID uh, in the Nordic region. Um, and that may be virtual as well. And uh, we are trying to set up one additional webinar for June. Uh, we think we have uh, someone uh, lined up and uh, we're just gonna confirm that and we'll send out an announcement uh, for um, hopefully a mid to uh, yeah, mid-June uh, webinar. Uh, so now, I, without further ado, I will uh, go to the webinar. Today, Lily Milani and uh, Nima Tunnison from the uh, University of Tartu will be talking about genetic, uh, genetics and electronic health records, uh, as well as um, uh, return of results, recalling people um, from uh, biobanks. And our panelists will be Sarah Haig from the Karolinska Institute, Nina Mars from FEM, and uh, Kari Stefansson from Decode. And during the talk, please consider these questions. And uh, along with adding questions to the Q&A box at the bottom, type in your thoughts about these that we can then forward to the panel. So I will now uh, end my uh, sharing, and I will invite Lily to begin. Uh, Lily Milani, are you there? Yes, I am here. So thank you for the introduction, Hokan, and uh, thank you for everyone who shows up from a public holiday or day between two holidays. Uh, in Estonia, it's not a day off, so <laughs> we didn't really think of that when setting up the date. Uh, we tend to work hard and, uh, and forget these things. But um, today, I'm, I'm glad to tell you a bit about the recent efforts at the Estonian Biobank and the Estonian Genome Center, uh, particularly around the studies of uh, genetic studies based on uh, data or health records from, from electronic health records and unstructured texts and uh, Neme will give you uh, the more interesting parts of uh, recall studies based on uh, genetic findings and, uh, and different studies of uh, piloting implementation of, of rare findings or polygenic risk scores. So just an introduction to the Estonian Biobank. It was established uh, in year 2000 as a prospective longitudinal volunteer-based biobank. And uh, today we have over 200,000 participants, which is around 20% of the adult population of Estonia. Uh, they have consented to regular updating of their health records from uh, the National Health Insurance Fund and other databases, as well as uh, registers uh, for health data. And everyone fills in a questionnaire uh, about their dietary habits, physical activity, and uh, uh, other factors. They all donate uh, a tube of blood 
uh, for extraction of DNA, plasma, and uh, long-term storage of uh, frozen uh, cells. And all the work is uh, regulated by the Estonian Human Genes Research Act uh, regarding what research we're allowed to conduct and uh, data updates. And uh, what is special with the law is also that they have a right to receive information on findings. So we, we almost have an obligation to return results to individuals, uh, especially now with the GDPR, and uh, they can ask for both their full genotype records, but also be contacted to participate in studies where we return results. Uh, regarding the electronic follow-up, uh, Estonia has a single-payer health insurance, so all of the records are uh, treatment bills and diagnosis are stored in one central database. And there is also an e-health central system where all health records have to be submitted. And uh, these can be in both structured form as well as uh, free full text records or so-called doctor's notes. And uh, regarding the clinical lab measurements, they are then extracted both from structured and unstructured sections of these electronic health records. And we can then create these kind of longitudinal records of uh, disease trajectories or uh, measurements and see where some uh, measurements have been off the chart or, or where they are starting to rise and so on. And more recently, we have been extracting more and more data from the free text records, uh, because that's where the interesting notes are from the doctors. And uh, especially, I will tell you a bit more about this part today. But first, regarding the omics profiling, so for the 200,000, all have been genotyped using the global screening array from Illumina. And 3,000 have been sequenced, whole genomes, and 2,500 have whole exome sequencing data. Then we also have an omics cohort of about 1,000 individuals that have been recontacted for um, fresh samples. And for these, we have then epigenetics and uh, RNA transcriptomics, as well as metabolomics from two time points and, uh, and some other measurements and deep clinical biochemistry uh, measurements as well. More recently, uh, we have a senior scientist back from UCLA who have set up uh, the collection of uh, microbiome samples. And so far we have 2,500 samples that have been sequenced, uh, uh, metagenomes have been sequenced. But uh, we're mostly focusing on this uh, 3,000 whole genome sequence samples as an imputation reference panel for the Estonian population. And uh, in different studies, we have seen that this is uh, superior to, to any broad panel, uh, at least uh, versus the human reference uh, consortium uh, panel and the 1,000 genomes. And um, we use this to impute both rare uh, variants and common ones into the genotype samples. And then using both imputation and long range haplotyping, we have found both rare mutations or genetic variants and uh, common ones that are then built into polygenic risk scores. And we're exploring how we can use these different layers of data for finding uh, genetic variants that are of relevance for, for individuals' health. And uh, Regarding the global screening array, so I think everyone is familiar with uh, genome-wide coverage of any Illumina array or other array for that matter. But what is special with our array is that it's the EST chip uh, array. So we have added also about uh, by now 4, 5,000 loss of function variants that were identified by whole genome sequencing in the Estonian population. And now we are trying to pick up these rare variants by genotyping as well. Uh, so regarding personalized medicine in Estonia, uh, rare diseases have actually been taken very well uh, care of by the Estonian Health Insurance Fund since 2014. They have covered the expenses of exome sequencing of trios in case of uh, rare diseases that's manifest in childhood. And um, this has been going on at the Tartu University Hospital 
uh, since 2014. But what we are focusing on in the Estonian Biobank and Estonian Genome Center is to see how we can use the Biobank for finding more uh, relevant genetic variants for common chronic diseases and cancer. For example, we have looked into both uh, monogenic and polygenic uh, scores for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes and breast cancer. And we're also looking into how we can use the genotype data for pharmacogenetics. So in order to find the effects of these different genetic variants and, and finding novel ones that are associated with health and health outcomes, uh, we have seen great value in electronic health records. And uh, although a lot of our work so far has been uh, on prescription records, so uh, health insurance fund bills for both uh, diagnosis and treatment and medications, which is a little bit noisy, but uh, some explore, we have been able to do a lot of association studies and, and exploration using this data. But there is a place where, where we meet the wall or we hit the wall where we are missing or lacking something. Some ICD-10 codes are not used in Estonia and some records are simply put in the pretext uh, uh, units of the electronic health records. So a very important partner for us in this work has been uh, Stuck, a text mining uh, company that's linked to the University of Tartu. And they have helped us to structure a lot more of the data that we have. So uh, the most recent extraction that they have done is from the doctor's notes or epicrisis. We have then 5.2 million files for 197,000 biobank participants. And this includes about 5 million uh, files total uh, of uh, different diagnoses of measurements and medications. And uh, in the table, you can see uh, the number of rows. So 8 million rows of diagnosis, 29 million rows of measurements and 2.8 million rows for medications. And it covers about well, more than 160,000 biobank participants uh, in these records. And uh, for example, when I'm studying adverse drug reactions, there are some kind of codes for, for some very severe reactions. And I will tell you a bit more closely about this, but um, for example, there are type A and type B reactions where type A are kind of uh, mostly considered dose dependent, more predictable and uh, due to the pharmacological action of the medication. While type B reactions are more uh, allergic reactions, uh, they have been considered dose independent, but that is starting to fade a bit uh, because uh, some reactions might still be due to higher, too high dosing. And, uh, but they are less predictable and they involve the immune system. So a challenge when we're studying drug allergies is that uh, most of it is actually stored in the health records as free text. And there is a complete mix of whether they're using drug names or active substances, the language that is used, be it Estonian, English or Latin names of these medications. Uh, doctors are quite famous for their typos. Uh, Estonian has a fancy case ending of every single word, depending on whether it's a preposition or past or future ten past tenses or uh, which person is being affected by something. And uh, of course, doctors love abbreviations as well. And um, this makes it all a bit tricky to process automatically. But good computer scientist finds way. So just a few examples of, of to illustrate what, what I just mentioned. You can have aspirin uh, in Estonian or in English. And uh, you, you can then uh, doctors sometimes use the commonly used name, but the official name is acetylsalicylic acid uh, or in Estonian acetylsalicylhappe. Uh, and in some cases they use the name of uh, a trade name instead of the active agent, uh, ibuprofen. So Estonian, one of the common ones is ibuprofen. And then in the allergies forms, you can have anything else from 
pollen to nuts to washing powders and, and being able to identify that that's not a drug is, is also important. So the second uh, is just the ending of, or the, instead of prepositions, Estonians have case endings, which adds to the word and can even change the end of the world, uh, the word. Uh, for example, biceptol uh, or clarithromycin. Here is an example of mixing English and Estonian spelling. And uh, here's an example of uh, when we were searching for uh, penicillin allergy in the electronic health records, how we can see all of these examples of uh, using Estonian spelling, uh, English spelling, and, and a mix of both, and, uh, and uh, abbreviations, and even not the word allergy, but uh, increased Ig levels, and, and so on. So, so this makes it a lot challenging, but good computer scientists can, of course, overcome these problems. So what Stack has done for us is to compose uh, comprehensive lists of drugs, and they have both computer scientists, uh, linguistic researchers, and these are all working together to create uh, uh, names, lists, or dictionaries of, of words that they're searching from the electronic health records. Uh, first by extracting the, the real names from the Agency of Medicines and then picking out uh, all the possible words that could, could be in the electronic health records. They can also use endings of words that are not so common in the Estonian language, uh, but are quite common endings of medications. And then they have ways of searching for words that are similar to the names in the existing list uh, and allowing typos and so on. So the final step is that they match the, the, all these weird names to the ATC codes uh, for, for further uh, analysis and structuring the data. And, and one example of a study that we ran based on this kind of data was uh, a GWAS of penicillin allergy uh, together with the UK Biobank and BioView in Vanderbilt University. And uh, what was... Uh, Peculiar was that there is an ICD-10 code for penicillin allergy, for self-reported penicillin allergy. And it's the ZETS 88.0 code. And uh, this uh, was present for about 5% of the UK biobank uh, participants. While in the Estonian biobank, we only had eight individuals out of 200,000 with this code. Uh, sorry, at that time it was 50,000. So, we, we had no choice but to go to the uh, free text sections in the electronic health records. And, uh, and our colleagues at Stuck, so Doug F. Zarek and uh, Sven Laur did really good work on extracting this. And also from the questionnaire data, we extract, extracted a few cases. So in total, we had 1,300 cases instead of eight and, and 43,000 controls. And in BioView, they had done something very similar. And uh, so they had extracted the penicillin allergy cases uh, from the allergy section of the electronic health records. And because they have a hospital-based biobank and some bits of selective genotyping, they actually had 12,000 cases and 38,000 controls. So we all ran these uh, GWAS uh, analysis separately, and then we did the meta-analysis. And we see a huge peak in the HLA region, which is not surprising, um, but also one additional peak on chromosome one in the BTPN22 gene, which is associated with several autoimmune diseases. And uh, we wanted to then find map the HLA locus in, in all of the three cohorts. So everyone all had the same SNP to HLA imputation uh, data or four digit HLA alleles. And here we were able to narrow it down to only one specific HLA allele that remained significant. And it was the HLA B star 5501. Uh, that was significant in all three cohorts. And uh, in addition, we did a, a replication in 23andMe uh, where they say, the SOF 
where we saw the same effect size and, uh, and significant uh, association for the same HLA allele. And uh, in the meta-analysis, we then have uh, see that individuals with this allele have a 33% high odds of penicillin allergy. And this is work by Christy Krebs, uh, who successfully defended her thesis recently and uh, has been running all this work with drug allergies and uh, NGWASs. Uh, Another way of looking at uh, treatment response is uh, just by looking at the medication use. So we have also done a few studies of just discontinuation of treatment versus uh, drug adherence. And uh, of course, there are a lot of different factors that affect this, but um, we, we have tried to narrow down the definitions and, and discontinuation and switching to, to figure out what we are actually picking up. So here is one of the uh, overviews of uh, antidepressants use or prescriptions in the Estonian biobank. So out of 200,000 individuals, we have 42,000 who have filled a uh, prescription for at least one antidepressant. And almost half of them have actually purchased more than one kind of an antidepressant. So here on the x-axis, you see the number of different antidepressants that someone has purchased. And you have people who have actually bought more than 10 different antidepressants. And then those who have uh, stayed on one medication. And overall, if you look at what is the first uh, antidepressant uh, and uh, that they start taking uh, in the, the blue ones are the ones that stay on that. Uh, medication and the green ones are the ones who switch from that medication to another medication. So it's fairly equal across the different uh, medicines, uh, whether people stay on the, the one or, or switch to another one. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of the first GWASs that we did for cases of uh, those who purchased uh, cases were defined as the individuals who purchased the first antidepressant and uh, switched to another antidepressant within five to 90 days. And after that, they were allowed to have a maximum one more purchase of the first antidepressant and controls are individuals who only purchased the first and stayed on that one and had at least three dispensers of that medication. And the sample sizes become fairly small with these definitions. So we have teamed up with the UK Biobank, uh, Catherine Lewis team uh, at UCL and, uh, and other cohorts uh, also at Vanderbilt now for, for increasing the sample sizes. Uh, but so acetalopram was the, the, the biggest case control one that we had looked into. And here's just the visualization of uh, cases. So uh, you can see that they have uh, one to two purchases of escitalopram, and then they have switched to another medication. And you can see that there are good examples of, okay, escitalopram really didn't work for that person, but um, some other antidepressant, uh, paroxetine, has worked very well. And, and then you have uh, another similar example, but then you have those who try a couple of medications and quit. Uh, and for the controls, you see those who have stayed on escitalopram for at least uh, three purchases. And then you have those who have very few, but those who have a longer uh, treatment period as well. So with these definitions, we didn't have a very impressive uh, GWAS on our own. Uh, there were some potential peaks and, and a few of them. I'm sorry, I don't have the pictures from the meta-analysis yet. Uh, but uh, there were a few that actually uh, passed a significance in, in the meta-analysis with uh, UK Biobank. Uh, but I uh, can't say much about the genes. The only common nominator we found is that they're a bit, uh, seem to have some links to schizophrenia. So we are looking into these results. So I just wanted to illustrate the kind of studies that we're running. And the final bit that we are really uh, excited about or, or waiting for data is uh, lab measurements um, from these electronic health records. 
and uh, uh, that are being extracted. So anything from cholesterol me measurements to um, blood glucose or BMI or, or changes in blood glucose over time and so on. So we are, sorry, my mouse froze for a minute. I hope the connection is still okay. Um, so these are just then uh, both looking into the structure ones and, and less structured sections and the code they are using to extract all of this. And when they are looking into these unstructured bits, it becomes even more challenging and diverse how doctors have actually uh, written the different measurements. For example, for PSA, you can have uh, comma places and, and spaces in very different places and, and the units can be pretty messed up. And, and the date is written in many different formats. And how do you distinguish uh, the date from the measurement and, and so on? But I'm telling you, our colleagues, they're really good. And uh, by now we have uh, structured uh, data and measurements for, for tens of different uh, biochemistry markers. And uh, sorry, sorry, this is in Estonian, but I think most of it is uh, easy to translate. Only blood pressure is better, uh, so I translated that one. I just got the, the records uh, a few minutes before the talk. But as you can see, the extraction is fairly successful. So the different measurements are available for, here you can see over 100,000 individuals uh, and uh, and then specific measurements uh, for creatinine or glucose for close to 100,000. And more and more is being extracted from these uh, uh, electronic health records. And uh, the final bit uh, I wanted to tell you about is uh, implementation. So uh, Neme will tell you about the genetic findings. But for pharmacogenetics, we've taken a very easy way out that all we wanted to do is to uh, see how much of existing published guidelines can we actually extract from the genotype data and translate the genotype data into uh, prescription guidelines. So CPIC and Farmware have done a great job in, in uh, gathering all these data into one or two <laughs> central databases. And, and CPIC is doing an excellent job of publishing prescription guidelines. So they go through peer review and are fairly reliable. And uh, as we decided to just take these guidelines and translate them into uh, pharmacogenetic recommendations, it was quite challenging. So we wrote a paper about it. So the first bit is that if you look into their drug def uh, allele definition tables in these different databases, then one uh, haplotype can match several different alleles. And you have to yourself do some kind of um, um, decision tree. So, so first of all, we check, uh, set a definition of uh, checking for non-functional alleles. If you carry uh, a variant that defines a non-functional allele, then you have a non-functional allele. And we let that override any other decision. And then finally, we come to whether you have a single match or whether you have an ambiguous call with uh, matching several different alleles. So we also compared whole genome, whole exome, global screening array, and Omni uh, Express, the old array. And for the arrays, we used genotype imputation and, uh, and argued a bit with the, one of the reviewers whether this is uh, fair or not. And uh, finally, it, we had to put on the figure label that this is using imputed data, and then it was okay. And at what we see is that whole exome sequencing is clearly missing regulatory variants that fall outside of the exome, both for CYP2C19 and CYP2C9, which is not surprising. But maybe what is most surprising is that uh, genotyping arrays are actually picking up a lot of the, the very important uh, variants for even the CYP2D6 uh, if we use genotype imputation. And we have also done quite a bit of uh, validation studies of these imputed variants, especially the CYP2D6-4, which is uh, the most frequent loss of function variant in, in this CYP2D6. And we see a 99.6% uh, concordance with uh, TACMAN assays. So 
Based on this, we have built these uh, pharmacogenetic reports for the biobank participants, and they have been able to see these together with the genetic counseling that they receive for whether it's uh, polygenic risk scores or, or other findings. And um, here's just an example of uh, an individual with uh, uh, loss of function variants in CYP2C19 from both the mother and the father. And uh, what was interesting was that she has been prescribed both escitalopram and sertraline and had severe side effects from both of them. And uh, she was uh, both impressed and sad that this information is actually in my genetic record and biobank knows this, but doctors ha don't have access to this. So today we have a national personalized medicine initiative that is working on, on building medical devices out of these different algorithms and uh, finding ways to actually implement uh, as much of these findings as possible in the healthcare system. So thanks for your attention. And the special credit of this work goes to what has been done for the association studies is Christy Krebs and, and Stuck for all of the text mining and uh, Sven and Daga for, for that work particularly. And um, that's it from me. Thank you. We uh, can move right along. And Nima, if, uh, if you would take down your slides, Lily, uh, we can uh, move along to Nima. And you yes. can mute and stop your video, please, Lily. I'd like to tell first that I really enjoyed uh, Lily's talk and um, <clears throat> being also a practitioner, I immediately recognized that actually Biobank has perhaps much better access to the um, uh, medical data that the doctors actually have. And this is exactly why, <laughs> why this uh, electronic health record system in Estonia is currently un also undergoing uh, re uh, restructuring and updates. But uh, the scope is still not finally clear, and uh, we will certainly hope for the best. So um, I'm going to talk about um, a few of our uh, data return projects, uh, what we have had in the Biobank so far. Uh, as Lily mentioned, the Biobank is really operating uh, based on the Human Genes Research Act, and it was kind of uh, visionary from the year 2000 stating that uh, all the participants uh, should have access to their personal data and uh, we have uh, uh, we have really possibility to decode and, and, and go back to the participants. Uh, there are also a few other important things mentioned that the participants should not be charged for accessing their data and um, there is there are certain clauses on uh, prohibition of uh, any kind of discrimination and the Sto as Estonia is also having uh, solidarity based healthcare uh, it's uh, quite unlikely that, the, that any kind of uh, discrimination should happen in the healthcare so this is why, why we also feel quite confident in, in returning the genetics data to people and so far um, approximately 4,000 people have written have um, had access to some of their genetic data from the biobank. So what about uh, the moral and ethic uh, questions? Of course, uh, uh, the scientists uh, would like to do something good for the, for the participants. Um, uh, they feel some duty to warn the people on the other hand, there is also uh, some caution required because we are the research institution. The data comes from research context. Uh, we feel that the, we should at least uh, um, uh, we should provide access to some counseling um, based on the data, and uh, this way we we could also cause some harm for the participants. So we have to pay respect for the autonomy and uh, carefully also cost, uh, consider the costs and resources needed. And I can, I can also tell that um, all those uh, high-risk monogenic variants, they have been double-checked from the existing sample by using a different method. Whenever the participant comes, there is a first visit with just taking the 
uh, taking a new sample and then rechecking again, either in our biobank or in our uh, clinical, uh, some of uh, our clinical partners lab. And so far we haven't really had any, any, um, any mistakes in, in our identifi identified variants, as far as I know. So I'm going to talk about uh, the breast cancer projects first, and then some cardiovascular uh, risk return projects. So this, uh, the first is our pilot on, uh, on uh, BRCA1 or 2 carriers, and uh, just to uh, show you what are the risk levels, uh, the lifetime cumulative risk levels for BRCA1 and 2 carriers for breast cancer the females have uh, 60 to 60 and above percent of chance of having uh, breast cancer and uh, a bit less chance for ovarian cancer. But on the other hand, uh, the ovarian cancer is even more dangerous because it's very hard to detect in uh, early stage. And uh, the BRCA1 and 2, they are also belonging to this famous ACMG gene list of minimal findings, uh, minimum gene list of uh, genetic findings that should be returned to participants or um, to patients actually, independent of their gender and, and age. And uh, we did um, identification of uh, BRCA1 and 2 pathogenic and uh, likely pathogenic variants from uh, the NGS data initially. And then we also use some um, array data uh, in addition, and um, counseled uh, 22 families based on this, uh, both females and males, independent of their age. Uh, also, uh, we did some cascade screening in the biobank setting, even if the family members were not the biobank participants. And, and this uh, was one way of uh, just extending the scope of the study. And to our great surprise, I think it was really the biggest surprise that uh, of those 20 families, just one was previously discovered and, and counseled. And this was an elderly lady having uh, breast cancer at the age of 75, which is usually considered the polygenic one. And uh, her daughter was, has died of ovarian cancer at the age of 42. And then the granddaughter had been uh, worried and uh, visited uh, clinical geneticist. So from this small study, um, just eight of uh, the 22 participants actually qualified for the high risk assessment according to NCCN criteria, uh, which rely on cancer on uh, young age or having multiple breast cancers in the family or multiple HPOC related cancers in the family. Um, From those 22 families, um, uh, actually one withdraw during the study, but, but she had some mental problems and what was kind of depressive and we just didn't find a way to contact her. Although there was a sister who really wanted, wanted to have this family, but actually uh, the sister was lucky and uh, she was uh, participating in our next study. Um, uh, relatives of 10 participants underwent cascade screening and uh, also five of uh, 16 eligible female carriers chose to undergo some risk reduction surgery. Uh, mostly it was, I think it was only uh, uh, bilateral uh, salping offer at Tommy, so that no mastectomy was performed. And mastectomy is not so traditional also in Estonia, usually they just uh, attend close monitoring after this uh, high risk variant identification. And we did also some uh, follow up uh, of the patients and uh, we saw that 10 clearly adhered to those surveillance recommendations, but some also uh, were lost during this process. So 
we just don't know. They, it, it could be that actually they were attending a different hospital, a different doctor, because uh, uh, in this case, we used uh, just one of the central hospitals to check uh, the surveillance. And uh, we have also by now uh, completed a national uh, clinical feasibility pilot and returning uh, breast cancer related genetic data. And this involves both uh, mutation data and also the polygenic uh, risk score data. And the data uh, is coming from our NGS data set and also uh, from the genotype data set. Uh, uh, and in this case, we're only able to invite uh, females, not the males. Uh, and the family members, they attended uh, uh, in a regular clinical setting. So we were able to counsel in total 109 uh, females with a high or moderate risk uh, genetic findings, and then also uh, more than 900 uh, women with a high polygenic uh, risk score level. And the counseling was done for mutation group in the clinical genetics and in oncology and uh, in a high polygenic risk score group, it was only in the oncology setting. And then we also had the standard mammography controls and, and it was used for cost efficiency, cost efficiency studies. So uh, this is uh, uh, the, the overview of genes where we had most of uh, findings and uh, it's largely BRCA1 and BRCA2 and we also had uh, some check findings. It, uh, it comes from the validation. I can't tell that it's, uh, it represents uh, the distribution in population because uh, if we are based on the array data. We also have some, we always have some good candidates and, and, and less good candidates. And we were, um, uh, as we also have some founder mutations in Estonia, we were uh, focusing on validating the good candidates because the study had uh, some certain um, uh, scope and how many we, we had the possibility to counsel. Uh, from the risk level, mostly they were high risk participants, uh, participants with high risk mutations. And in this case, it was uh, just 10% of the families who had a previous counseling in a clinical setting. From the polygenic uh, risk score on, we used a model which was published in uh, 2019 by Edris And uh, if this blue line shows the Estonian uh, breast cancer risk baseline, uh, the red line shows the top 5% of uh, polygenic score uh, risk levels uh, for women. And um, uh, in the top 5%, it's roughly doubled. And this quite nicely justifies uh, a personalized um, uh, follow-up for those women. Uh, by WHO recommendations, most of countries start mammography at the age of 50. And uh, this risk estimate uh, in the high polygenic uh, uh, risk group is achieved already at the age of uh, uh, 37 years. So uh, we invited really women from, from 40 and above to uh, oncology counseling and, and mammography. So uh, what happened with the cancer cases in these groups, in this study? Um, we saw 16 cancers uh, in uh, mutation group in different um, organs mostly of course in breast and ovaries. And uh, I just wanted to uh, point to your attention here that uh, we always see, although the clinical guidelines usually put a threshold of age at uh, 50 or below, 
we always see that at least one third of the cancers uh, occur in more advanced age. So uh, it might be uh, Estonian speci specificity because we still are not at uh, this high risk uh, level with the breast cancer as the Scandinavian countries or UK or US. But uh, to me, it seems that really, if we are talking about the age limits, uh, we should consider that actually the monogenic cancer could also occur in more advanced age. And uh, we also discovered uh, new uh, cases um, in, in the polygenic risk course group. Okay, also in the patient group, uh, one breast cancer was discovered throughout the study. It was just uh, a 37 year old uh, woman uh, who was actually, as I remember, uh, she was a, a sister of a broadband, probably, but um, uh, she was really, I would say she was lucky because uh, she was discovered still in early, early stage. And in this polygenic risk score group, we also discovered uh, uh, cancers in, uh, in uh, different uh, ages, but most of them fall at the age 70 and above, uh, which is also quite uh, interesting because usually in a Estonian setting, we stop any mammography at, at the age of uh, 69. So it, it might be that actually we should suggest that uh, mammography would be continued, started more early compared to the regular uh, age and continued uh, after the regular uh, screening stops. Some of the cancers were also discovered before study, but uh, data was just missing uh, in our database. So we have uh, some delay because due to the linking and uh, importing all the diagnosis in our database. So talking about the cost efficiency, uh, this personalized approach uh, seems to be quite efficient. Our calculations uh, show that uh, for a uh, quality life year, we should pay less than 7,000 euro. And for a life year gained, it's uh, uh, less than 5,000 euro. So usually in healthcare, all uh, interventions that are have quality uh, costs less than 30,000 euro, they, they are quite uh, well accepted. And if, if the costs are less than 10,000 euro, it's uh, even much better. So I think it's a viable strategy and we should definitely continue with implementing it. So uh, we also follow the psychosocial aspects. Uh, what are the participants' feelings? of the counseling in the uh, mutation group and in polygenic risk score group. What we see is that most of participants were quite calm, confident and relaxed. Uh, of course, uh, we have a few uh, also worried or having some being anxious or uh, feeling tense. And uh, also there is we didn't run any statistic analysis here. It seems that uh, perhaps there is more confidence in the high polygenic risk or group because uh, uh, people having mutations and being also the relatives immediately asked to counseling, it, it is a bit more uh, tension probably for them. But overall, uh, majority really felt that it was the right decision to come. And uh, I didn't hear of anyone telling that you shouldn't have invited me. But of course, we don't know uh, what do those people think who just didn't attend. So continuing with cardiovascular disease projects, we had um, uh, one project on uh, familial hypercholesteremia. Again, uh, one disorder uh, in this famous uh, ECMG uh, list. And it's severely underdiagnosed. So both, actually, it's, it seems that both uh, uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and also this uh, familiar hypercholesteremia uh, in Estonia have uh, frequency, perhaps uh, one in 200 or even more. 
And um, it's a metabolic defect where people can't utilize uh, uh, effectively their LDL. So it should be actually very easy to just uh, measure LDL cholesterol and uh, having it to distinguish between, between this uh, genetic, monogenic and polygenic uh, dyslipidemia, but actually it's not uh, so simple. Uh, of course, there are some clinical criteria on how to, how to find those uh, people who might be at risk. But uh, looking at this chart uh, where there is uh, um, a polygenic dyslipidemia and monogenic dyslipidemia, there is a, a large overlap. And actually, in, in also in our study, what we saw is that uh, most of those people with FH mutations, they don't have very, uh, very really high levels of LDL cholesterol. They are they have a moderate increase. So what happened before, pre and after study is that uh, pre study most of people either had no diagnosis or just uh, having the diagnosis of uh, polygenic hypercholesterolemia. As uh, post study, of course, uh, they were identified as people with uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia. I can also tell that um, it, it was kind of eyes opening for uh, the medical genetics community. So before they didn't really want to deal with this uh, that much, but but we really see that uh, that, that uh, FH diagnosis is becoming better in Estonia even if the initial testing for the proband, it's, it's still quite costly, but at least it's, it's ongoing. Uh, so pre-treatment people had either no, uh, no treatment at all or had uh, mostly moderate intensity statin treatments after uh, study, they were uh, prescribed with either moderate or uh, high intensity statin drugs. Um, and in our national pilot, uh, uh, we had also other study, other clinical study on cardiovascular disease, and it was performed uh, in collaboration with the biobank and family practitioners. Large and the, and the risk score what we used uh, uh, really shows in the top. It's the top quintile here. It shows uh, that there is an increase in myocardial infarction on both men and women and uh, increase in cardiovascular mortality in men. It's all based on, uh, on our uh, pre-expansion data. So I think uh, if we would run the study now on our 200,000 cohort, we could do even better. So this is a study scheme. Uh, it was meant for 30 to 70 year old uh, uh, participants. Uh, there was an intervention group and control group. It was a randomized study, but open label uh, for the doctors. And um, uh, the participants in the intervention group had three visits uh, for the um, family doctors, where uh, they had the risk factors um, measured. They were counseled, uh, optionally they received some therapy and there was a control group, but also the control group was uh, counseled at the end of uh, the study. And then we compared the blood pressure, cholesterol level, smoking and cor total cardiovascular uh, risk estimates. And uh, there was a clinical decision support software used for this. It's a cardiocompassy finish developed uh, um, uh, web browser um, interface tool. And we saw that the doctors really liked it. It's, uh, it's uh, interactive and uh, they were able to enter their actual levels of blood pressure and cholesterol and smoking and to see what, what it does with the risk estimates. So what happened after the study, uh, the analysis is still somewhat, somewhat ongoing, but we, we were able to see some, uh, some significant changes 
in uh, uh, in the uh, cholesterol level uh, and the LDL cholesterol level drop. So what do the patients uh, feel and uh, think about this study? Um, mostly they uh, felt quite confident. Uh, they valued the study. They thought it was quite informative um, and interesting and easy to understand. Of course, there were also some uh, who were confused or uh, worried and uh, did not care. But overall, I think the picture is rather positive. I can also tell that um, over 85% of physicians participating, they thought that this kind of uh, clinical decision support software was very much uh, helpful for explaining patients what do the risk factors actually do. And it was also helpful for them to decide whether to apply any therapy or not. So uh, I think we, we could see uh, that the biobank and by these uh, return of data studies and collaborative studies with clinicians, the biobank could really support uh, the healthcare system, uh, show the new opportuni opportunities coming uh, from genetics in medicine. And uh, by improving the healthcare, I think we also uh, help ourselves in the biobank because then we get more data and, and uh, more... Uh, people knowing about us, the doctors knowing about us, having more trust and visibility in the society. So to conclude shortly, so I think with a careful protocol and counseling, the return of biobank data for clinical interventions is fully feasible and justified. Uh, majority of participants uh, regard this genetic risk information useful and can manage their psychosocial risks. Uh, the clinical guidelines have to be revised and also the target groups for clinical genetic testing and, and screening should be probably expanded and, and quite a lot. And we should establish uh, novel service models by integrating genetics into primary care and also uh, collaborating with uh, uh, specialty care. We should also organize a long-term follow-up studies of participants, uh, how do they comply and, and what kind of, um, uh, what is the actual clinical outcome? So with this, I would like to thank our uh, collaborators. This is more or less the same slide that uh, Lily showed. I just added some names from the national pilot study here. And uh, thanks a lot to the audience also for your kind attention. Thank you, Nime, and uh, thank you, Lily. And even as we were listening to the talks, um, we heard from Mark Daly confirming that he will give another webinar. So we'll extend our season into June. Uh, we don't have a date or um, topic yet, but uh, we'll pass that on as soon as we get that. Uh, we do have a question for Lily and Nima from Laura Langor. What happens to biobank participants data if the participant moves to another country? Will the data remain in the biobank? Do the participants still have access to data and results after moving abroad? And uh, do they have the right for counseling still? Uh, well, I could try to add. So basically, uh, once they have joined the biobank, uh, they still maintain all the rights. Uh, do you agree, Lily? So it's dependent on the person, not the, not the citizenship. Uh, but currently, the counseling is. Uh, it depends on our uh, possibilities because uh, currently nobody is ordering it. We are uh, uh, creating projects and actively looking for funding. But uh, but there is actually, we get a lot of uh, national support as well. And uh, there are activities in the Ministry of Social Affairs and, and uh, among the healthcare payers. So, so it's, a, it's a, just a process uh, when everybody will eventually have access to the data. All you need to be a biobank participant is an Estonian uh, ID code. So either you have to be uh, an Estonian resident or e-resident, 
which is another thing Estonia has been promoting lately. Uh, so you can become an Estonian e-resident, get an Estonian ID card, set up a company in Estonia and so on. And, and that having that Estonian ID card gives you uh, also access to join the biobank. But uh, as you saw in, in one of my slides that we don't have health records for, for all 200,000. So some of them that are living abroad or have been living abroad for a longer time, uh, for them, we don't have uh, any health records. And um, all we have is questionnaire data that they filled in when they joined the biobank. Um, I think I will ask the uh, panelists to come in. And, uh, but in the meantime, I have a question for Lily. If uh, you can scale this up to a Nordic level, what advantages does that give you? And conversely, um, what uh, problems would you have in terms of uh, text mining and, you know, what, uh, where would there be, how would you solve those problems? And are you already doing that at some level with collaborations with other countries in the Nordic region? Um, yeah, we are collaborating a lot with uh, all the Nordic countries. And um, I think the text mining, I mean, the, the biggest challenge is creating these uh, language, uh, sorry, my kid has And basic, so sorry about the pings. Uh, but um, yeah, the language is the biggest barrier that um, creating these dictionaries in the different languages and, and doing the text mining. But I think within different EU projects, we're also working on this uh, and uh, not only in the Nordics, but uh, with Spain and uh, Edinburgh and, and other countries. So. Uh, I think Finnish is, of course, the closest one uh, linguistically. So these uh, different European efforts of structuring electronic health records is also uh, ongoing efforts that, that, that our collaborators are part of. So I think this is definitely a, a field that everyone is uh, working on. Um. We don't have any other questions right now, um, but please continue to ask questions uh, if you're in the audience. Uh, let's move on to the panel. Uh, Will uh, Kauri seems to have stepped out. Um, Rhett, do you have a question in his place? Yes. So first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Lily and Nime for excellent talks. Kauri had to enter into another meeting and uh, apologies for that. But he said that uh, um, you guys were on the right path towards practicing uh, personalized medicine in, in Tallinn. And he entered the talk. Um, I thought it was interesting to see uh, in the, uh, the meta-analysis how, the, how uh, consistent the effects were in all the uh, populations that we looked at. So um, for the HLA uh, variant, and uh, uh, it's promising what you guys are doing also when it comes to the antidepressant, uh, antidepressant uh, uh, meta-analysis. I just wanted to mention that we have a fairly large sample here at DCOT. I think we have about 30,000 individuals that have been diagnosed with depression and we have uh, uh, drug data on a fairly large fraction. So if you need uh, replication data, uh, we would be happy to, to share those, uh, Lily. Yes, um, I will send you the analysis plan. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so uh, that looks uh, look promising and interesting. Um, then I wanted to ask a little bit, uh, uh, I know uh, the passion for uh, uh, basically the... Uh, uh, the loss of function variants uh, for understanding better the uh, the uh, uh, structure of these variants that affect uh, uh, degradation of, of drugs, etc. What are the plans, the upcoming plans now um, that you are focusing on when it comes to understanding better the, the structure and uh, loss of function variants, etc., etc.? 
Yeah, so we have done um, very specific uh, analysis, both uh, as part of the Comorment project, looking into drug targets of psychiatric medications, and then picking loss of function or missense variants in these genes, and the next running phenome-wide association studies for these uh, variants to see what they are actually linked with and if there are any opportunities for drug repurposing uh, or uh, if we see any additional uh, um, side effects or long-term side effects uh, of these medications. And, and the other thing is uh, the 5,000 loss of function variants that we identified from the whole genome sequencing. So these are in, in fairly random genes, uh, of course, some high impact known genes as well. And, and there we are just, just digging into the data because we just finished the genotyping of all the 200,000 and the imputation and, and all the QC. So we're trying to find um, how to proceed with these uh, findings and, um, and to, if we find any new uh, drug targets or, or interesting uh, findings in these uh, especially very rare loss of function variants, uh, of course, we will turn to Finland and Iceland for for application and and looking at these as well. Uh, one final question. So, uh, you have these arrays where you have uh, loss of function variants uh, in uh, that are population specific. So, uh, are you uh, basically uh, selecting all, even if you only find it in one uh, sequenced case? Or is there a criteria how many you find? And when you are uh, genotyping, how many of them do you confirm? Um, so basically, um, think about the error rate and how useful it is to have the very rare variants on the chips. Yeah, so I, I guess the biggest challenge is that the clustering and automated uh, genotype calling doesn't work in Genome Studio or on these Illumina arrays for these ultra rare variants. Uh, so we actually have uh, Marie Nellis has uh, looked through all of these manually and, mm -hmm. and flagged them for me. Oh. So uh, in that sense, it's been, it's been, yes, very manual work, but uh, I still think it's very valuable. And, um, and we're still trying to analyze the, the concordance with whole genome and also with um, uh, imputation. So for the allele call one, of course, it's yes, we included those on the array. And um, we are still, yeah, we haven't looked into those quite yet. Uh, but the, the ones with allele call two, so identified in at least two genomes, and there we see uh, uh, even possibilities of uh, imputation or long range haplotyping. So I think these are very good questions and I hope to have uh, clearer answers for you on the results um, in, in uh, a month or so. Thank you so much. Let's uh, move along and uh, Nina Mars um, from FEM, uh, would you like to have some comments and questions? Yes, so thank you a lot for your talk. And I, I think both of your uh, talks were a nice example of, of uh, showing how to utilize these data in a collaborative manner between different fields and, and uh, also in a very translational, translative manner. Uh, so continuing a bit about uh, with a previous, previous question in the beginning of our, our uh, panel discussion. So I think lab measurements are a very exciting addition to your rich data set and, and um, they, of course, come with challenges, as, as you, Lily, showed in your talk. So, um, because, um, yeah, they are a very, very important uh, source for potential environmental risk factors and, and endophenotypes that can be used for, for improving our understanding of diseases. Um, so, so, kind of, one first question, I, I have a couple of more, but... Um, have you used the lab measurements in, in any, any other ways or have you extracted any other data from the electronic health records? Uh, no, I would say we've just started this and um, most of the studies we've run so far is uh, 
health insurance data. So diagnosis, uh, medications and procedures uh, from the health insurance fund. Uh, but yeah, this is the new avenue that we're exploring now with, uh, with all these structured and extracted uh, measurements and uh, we're looking into polygenic risk scores and seeing uh, glucohemoglobin and, uh, and other questions that we are really interested in. Um, but I actually wanted to throw back uh, uh, to Nina that she, I'm actually really impressed that, and I think it requires uh, special attention that Nina has actually run uh, really nice studies uh, on combination of polygenic risk scores and uh, uh, monogenic variants and uh, breast cancer uh, and, and even more. So maybe you could also just uh, open that area a bit of the power of combining these two together. And uh, I think that's a great uh, addition to this panel, the work that you've done at BIM. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that's one of the most important uh, potential areas with clinical utility that's, uh, that quite well answers to, to a clinical, specific clinical challenge we have when individuals with breast cancer come to the clinic um, they have a concern about their uh, relatives and their daughters and sisters getting breast cancer and, and um, kind of combining the information we have about genetic variants, both common and, and rare ones are, are important in that sense. And also in individuals who have tested positive for, for high risk variants. But yeah, in terms of that, there's a lot of work to do. do uh, something that NAMES showed is, is the aspect of returning variants and, and how to do this properly. And, and maybe that brings me to one of my next questions to, to NAMES, that um, um, as you showed, we, we uh, actually see in FinGen the same, that quite many of the high risk variant carriers have uh, been diagnosed with breast cancer at a regular screening age. So we see early onset cases, but also individuals who have, have been diagnosed at, through regular screenings. Uh, so, so let's say that we would be in the phase where, where this kind of uh, returning of genetic information would be commonplace. So um, based on your research and expertise, what would you say is the, the kind of um, best age in which to return this information and, and um, maybe also answering this for other diseases such as the cardiovascular disease. So, so what would be the potential age when you would return this? I would actually start with this, that um, we would be really happy to collaborate on combining this kind of polygenic and monogenic findings because there's always question if you have enough, enough power uh, if you if you want to combine both uh, those, so um, in cancer and in, in cancer especially because there is no intermediate phenotype to look for. So, uh, but looking at the at the breast cancer data, I would say that uh, certainly we should raise the the age limit to sixty probably. And it's also said that you should, you could use 60, but uh, 60 for uh, hormone negative cancers, but actually nobody knows. And even if it was diagnosed 10 years ago, there is hardly any data about the hormonal status. So in, in academic uh, thinking, you might uh, do it, but actually it's not working. Just raise the age limit and do it uh, in a more relaxed way, test more, and you will certainly find more. And the other challenging thing is, uh, I, I really think that the E has, um, uh, environment in Estonia needs a kind of updating that we should state that genetic risk factors are not the question of today it's also it's a lifelong uh, thing that should be uh, remembered uh, for the doctors and also pa the patients because you know if you have a doc document based uh, data management uh, you always have something just below the stack of the new more recent findings and nobody actually remembers what happened 10 years ago so, but happy to collaborate with you, Nina. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Nina. Uh, let's move on to uh, Sarah Haig from Karolinska Institute and um, your comments and questions. Sure. 
Yes, I've been following the discussion and thank you both for really interesting presentations. Um, I really enjoyed it. And also coming back to some of the questions that uh, Lily had listed from the beginning. So I think the way that you approach this is the way forward that you work together, both from geneticists and clinicians and really try to integrate the new data into healthcare in, in a good way so that everyone can appreciate it in, in the right way. Uh, so one question I had, I think nearly Nimi almost answered it. So what's the representation of the Estonian biobank? If, if it's um, more of a healthy selection that we see in other cohorts as well. And then Nimi said something, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, I, I don't, actually they are a bit more healthy as well, but, but uh, we see that uh, uh, we have uh, more women joining the biobank. I have a chart actually, uh, uh, sharing it might take time. So um, uh, it's indeed uh, two thirds roughly are women. And then there is uh, also extension in the in the younger arm of younger age groups uh, because they are just more active to to join any kind of public activities, and especially in our last expansions uh, uh, a couple of years ago, the younger people were more eager to join. And, but on the other hand, it's very good because uh, they are this population uh, most benefiting for any kind of prevention. So. I think it's uh, correct that they, they are also slightly, not only slightly more healthy, but slightly higher education. So people with higher education are slightly overrepresented and uh, people with uh, basic education are slightly underrepresented. Uh, but it's not too bad. It's like um, a quite similar reflection of the, the population. And uh, I think we also see that um, when we send out new questionnaires, so recently we did a mental health follow-up questionnaire. And uh, within one month, we had uh, 70,000 who filled in the questionnaire. So it was about 20, 30 minute questionnaire and um, 20, about, yeah, uh, about well-being and mental health during the peak of the pandemic. <laughs> so um, uh, when it was just uh, as work, yeah, the worst peak in Estonia. And uh, so I think they are very committed, but it's, it's of course uh, hard to reach all 200,000 and um, the really active recruitment phase we had in 2018 when 100,000 people joined the biobank. It was advertised and uh, everywhere and uh, collection in pharmacies and uh, people actually inviting people to join. And uh, we had recruitment at festivals or concerts and, and a lot of outdoor activities, about over 100 different uh, outdoor activities. And there we, we were able to uh, maybe even out this a little bit because we were out on any small village uh, and uh, very smaller locations as well. And um, what do you call it? A lot like um, markets or outdoor events and so on. So. Uh, that even did out a little bit at least, but yes. That's right. Good. Yeah. Well, that, that sounds really good, but because I think then that it has the potential to, I mean, to include uh, genotypes in a healthcare system where everyone is included, it means that the, the benefit is even greater than we can measure today with the data we have today. So, um, yeah, yeah, really impressive. And, from the Swedish perspective, we of course look into all the other Nordic countries then and, and appreciate what you do. And uh, in terms of screening for the breast cancer, for example, we have a start age at 40 years in Sweden. So we start a little bit earlier, but on the other hand, maybe it would have been more efficient if we, some of the money that is used for the screening program could instead be used for genotyping to uh, optimize the screening programs in a better way. And, uh, so I guess we we put money into other parts of the healthcare system in Sweden, uh, which perhaps is not the most cost-effective uh, way forward. But yes, that's a, a bit different. So that was one comment. Um, and um, yeah, another comment I've been thinking about this: if we go towards this personalized medicine and using the genotypes in, together with electronic health uh, records. Uh, should we not also focus on the, um, the difference in um, 
between men and women. We have, you said you had different response rates, but also from a biological perspective, it's different. And I think that there are some new uh, efforts now coming out where they do um, sex specific GWAS analysis. And do you think that that will um, also be important in future predictions? Yeah, uh, I, I think that's really important. And uh, that's one of the highlights of having 200 biobank participants genotype finally, uh, that now we can actually split them into uh, running sex specific GWASs as well. Uh, so far, our sample sizes were just too small, uh, but now we can clearly do this. And, uh, and yeah, for some traits, we see very different effects. And uh, I think that's definitely a way forward. I don't know how it's in clinical genetics. Neme, any additions? So we, we don't do associations there yet, but uh, there is definitely a different response rate. Also, we had, uh, we invited uh, men and women for this BRCA counseling, but obviously more, much more women attended. I don't recall the percentages exactly, but uh, for men it was lower. It would be it would be then quite challenging to have something done on, on uh, prostate cancer, just on our own to see how much the men are uh, eager to to join and, and to answer some questions. But this is usually done by by specialty clinics. Then we should definitely collaborate. So women are. I feel that women are really ready to go to doctors and men usually are not unless they feel some pain or they are bleeding somewhere or, or unless there is some serious problem. We've been around the panel once, so I, now I would just uh, say uh, if there are any other questions, if uh, you could uh, just um, raise your hands or uh, just uh, pop in questions for Lily and Nima. Well, I think that uh, perhaps it's it being Friday afternoon and uh, it being a, um, what did you call it, Lily, the day? Lamb and dog. <laughs> day between two holidays. <laughs> right. You, the donut hole, perhaps, uh, might be another way you put it. To, um, so uh, thanks to the speakers. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Thanks to Nico for, of course, organizing and keeping us on track. And the webinar will be recorded and posted uh, to the website and um, look out for an announcement about our June webinar with Mark Daly. And we'll let you know as soon as we can, uh, I think within the next two weeks, whether what dates the annual meeting and, and that, uh, <laughs> the, what was, should have been the biennial meeting, it'll be the uh, every four years meeting, I guess, at this point um, in November, it will have dates in the next few weeks, uh, as well as for the COVID-19 research satellite meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Thank a lot you. for this kind invitation. It was really a pleasure to join it. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who came despite the holidays. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.